thank you everyone for joining hundreds of people literally around the world to hear about the state of finance transformation. <clears throat> Somebody has already Q&A'd me the question, uh, when are you giving away the free KSCO pass? Uh, shockingly, we're gonna do it towards the end, but it's worth up to $2,400, so you might wanna stick around. Uh, in the meantime, I promise to educate and potentially entertain you with content. I am Edward Roski. I am CEO here at Argano Interrel, and today I am your guide through a world that is changing right before our eyes. It's this rapid time of transformation. Welcome everyone to the Digital Renaissance. Once upon a time, there was a renaissance, a rebirth. This was the era when science and logic conquered magical thought, when civilization was elevated out of darkness, when men and women stopped looking only at the outward appearance of the world and pressed for answers on how it all works, on what lies below the surface. This scientific spirit led to technologies like the printing press, which empowered the first information age and foisted into history an era of common understanding and uncommon innovation in science, in culture, in politics and in commerce. Just as that explosion of perspectives and technologies propelled mankind forward for over 500 years, a new digital renaissance has arrived to once again revolutionize, remake and reach out of the world. This new renaissance, this digital renaissance has made the magic seem mundane and many of our most coveted visions and hopes are coming to pass. Tickets into space, vaccines in months, doorstep deliveries in hours. This digital renaissance is creating a platform for transformation even deeper than that of its predecessor. Like the printing press before it, the technologies of the digital renaissance, when used masterfully, shine light into the darkest corners, helping all master the unseen world, helping all conquer complexity, and helping all turn dreams of change into effective action and all these raise our collective expectations for the human experience we are in the digital renaissance it's this era of transformation it's a time of innovation and customization and automation information for literally everyone in the world and we're trying to figure out how we can reimagine what that world looks like. We're trying to look at what's coming and we can do that using the lessons from the past, but we can make sure we're not repeating the mistakes of the past. The digital renaissance is not the first time we've been hopeful. It's not the first time that we've actually believed there's a better time ahead of us. Our best days are still yet to come. Humans, since the dawn of time, have had ambitions for a better future. They've had a belief, a, a dream, that our best days are ahead of us. And sometimes those dreams turn into reality. Humans invent technology, the lever, the ramp, the wheel, the Tesla, to deliver on those great ideas. But just having an invention doesn't deliver that technology to the world because the people with those ambitions, the ones who actually invent things, are not great distributors of those technology. And that's where companies come in. Corporations exist to enable that amazing technology that the dreamers come up with, to enable that technology at scale. And this is how it's been done at every massive period of innovation since the dawn of recorded time. Uh, just in the last 500 years, the Italian Renaissance, the first industrial revolution, the semiconductor explosion, the digital Renaissance we're all living in, every time there's a fundamental transformation in how the world functions, 
It's because companies have stepped forward to deliver on those amazing human ambitions. If companies prepare themselves for any change that the world throws at them, they can then take that technology, no matter what it is, no matter how disruptive it is, and they can deliver that technology at scale, and they can deeply transform the world. Now, notice I said deeply transform, and that's because to thrive in this digital renaissance we're living through, we can't just do small incremental change. We need to deeply transform ourselves, ourselves, our companies, our world. Because deep transformation is lasting, impactful transformation. It's transformation that gives you a fundamental new capability you didn't have before. It's transformation of your processes, your technologies, your people, your very culture. It's transformation that gives you an ongoing ability to adapt to change no matter what we are going to see, no matter what we've seen in the past, no matter what things we can't imagine. Because deep transformation affects not just what's on the surface, it's what goes on below the surface. It's what goes on behind the scenes. Because deep transformation affects people and their organizations on a cellular level. And here's the good news for all my finance and accounting friends here today. I'm glad to see uh, a couple hundred of you. Uh, during times of rapid transformation, people crave data. They want something secure. What they're craving is information. Information is like a bright light in a dark cave. And the ones who have that light, the ones who have that information on how to get out of the darkness, that's finance. It's IT providing the data and finance analyzing it. And what we have to do is make sure that we are not the ones transforming more slowly than the rest of our organization. We want to make sure as finance and IT and technology professionals, we are the first ones out of that dark cave. The digital renaissance is shifting the finance function and the technologies to be the strategy driver in this time of transformation. <clears throat> I'll tell you, I, I feel a little bit like Biden this morning because I've been working on this presentation for weeks. And when I started putting this presentation together a few weeks ago, there wasn't a war going on in Eastern Europe, which just kind of goes to show you how fast things change. Two years ago, on March 2nd, there wasn't a pandemic that didn't actually get declared until it was March 11th of 2020. It's no real surprise. Uh, the world has been in a state of, we could politely say transformation, we could impolitely say chaos the last few years, and it's created never-ending economic uncertainty and business uncertainty for finance and technology professionals. We are the ones who have to deal with the impacts, and we're the ones who get yelled at if we didn't somehow see all this coming. Like if we didn't have systems ready to deal with pandemic and inflation and supply chain disruption and cybersecurity attacks and digital currencies and the war for talent, for that matter, actual war. I'll let you in on a little inside Interrel uh, information. Uh, at the end of 2020, Interrel merged uh, with a few other world-class service providers around the world to form Argonaut. Uh, some people think that it's been around, the word has, it's actually an Italian word meaning to lift or shift. The actual company has been around very, very recently because we merged uh, seven companies together. We went from 100 employees in one country um, to last check 1,276 employees across 10 countries. Um, United States, Canada, Puerto Rico, Mexico, India, Argentina, Fiji, Georgia, Australia, and we actually have 20 great, amazing Argonauts in Ukraine. Now, when this year started, we didn't think that we'd be personally affected by geopolitics. But now, with this weight on my heart and my soul, we have to consider the consequences of this recent invasion on all of our worlds. We're an interconnected planet, and we're becoming more connected all the time. Just like two years ago, a pandemic started somewhere in a far-off land, but then it quickly came home. It crushed the world out of nowhere, and now we're living through 
war sanctions and their impact, invasions and posturing and changing and shifting alliances, and they affect how all of us plan for 2022. And every one of you, not just at the business level, every one of you on a personal level will feel the impact. Because in this time of unknown certainty, <clears throat> all we can be confident of is there are different scenarios that could play out. What we are trying to do is make sure that all of us as professionals plan for those possible options. Uh, we want to plan for a level of uncertainty. We want to plan for a model to make us able to respond and pivot to whatever that change is. For instance, uh, if you're doing strategic modeling, you can use it to find out how is the change in oil prices, commodity prices, oil supply going to affect you? How can you position yourselves to ride that out? How drastic uh, and impactful and wide-reaching will the sanctions be? Uh, what happens if there are increased missile or defense sales to Ukraine? Even if you don't have employees in Ukraine like we do, um, if, it doesn't matter if your industry is high-tech or retail or transportation or anything else, you are going to feel the impact of this. Oh, someone just asked me in the chat if our 20 people are safe. Um, yes, uh, at the moment. Uh, we actually offered to evacuate them, um, host them in a nearby country, cover all the costs. The response I got uh, was that Ukraine is their homeland. Um, the, the metaphor was, Edward, if Russia was about to invade the United States, would you take up our offer to evacuate you to Canada? Um, and my answer would be hell no, and I would grab the nearest gun. And I live in Texas, so they're basically everywhere. Um, the people in the Ukraine are safe. Uh, they're safe for now, uh, but they're brave and they're willing to fight alone. Uh, but let's not make them feel like they have to fight alone. Um, that's very heavy. It's very tough to segue from. But I'm going to try and pivot from uncertainty on the world stage to rapid economic changes at home. Even before Russia rather abruptly invaded Ukraine after telling the world it wasn't going to, organizations were feeling the impact of cost increases across everything, staffing to materials, people to products, you name it, and it's only accelerated in the last week and a half. The rise in inflation isn't just an economic hit. It's not just cutting into profit margins. It actually affects our decisions. How do we price our own products? What are our go-to-market strategies? How do we handle our relationship with our vendors? Our financial projections were already unreliable since the start of the pandemic due to all that greater economic uncertainty. They're now even under more strain because now we have to take our three to five scenarios and go, well, how bad could inflation possibly be? Is the Fed going to raise rates one time, three times, five times, seven times this year? Or are they going to hold off because they don't want to kick us into a recession while there's a war being raged? I'll give you some good economic news. We just went through the COVID recession. We went through the fastest V-shaped recession and recovery in world history. I went back and looked at the recovery after every pandemic, and it was not this steep as the fall, and it was not this steep on the increase. The bad news, right now we're in a situation where demand exceeds supply. And as we all learned in Economics 101, when demand exceeds supply, prices go up. And they are going up like we have not seen them since the late 1970s and early 1980s. It's not just one economist didn't predict this level. No one predicted this level. There's a lot of blame to go around as to what caused it. That's not for us to decide. What we have to decide is how we're going to deal with it and how we're going to deal with the various scenarios that it creates. And as if rising costs were not a big enough impact, we also are seeing this massive launch in ransomware. Uh, to go back to another more, a war point, I have never seen a war fought, not just on the, the water, not just on the land, not just in the sky, not just uh, on forces everywhere, but actually forces in cyberspace. The level of cyber attacks that are happening is insanity. And it's hitting all of us. And the need for this cybersecurity is even greater if we're in an area where we provide a critical service. We've even seen in the last few months ransomware attacks on utilities. We've seen them on hospitals. And it's not because they're aiming for them. It's not because they care about taking down utilities and hospitals. It's actually because they don't care. 
They don't care about your company specifically. This is a business for them. And they know there's a price you'll pay. And it's an exchange of value. You want your information back, you want the hackers out of your system, it's gonna cost you this much. It has never been more important to have security measures in place because we have to protect our systems and we have to protect our data. Uh, my advice to anyone who's stressing every single night as you go to sleep about potential cybersecurity hackers, <clears throat> put your systems in the cloud and make that cybersecurity a problem for people who do this full time for a living. Make your cybersecurity problem into Oracle or Amazon or Microsoft or Google's security problem. Make them have to deal with keeping the bad guys out because I'm telling you, this is not a battle that you want to be in. Um, if you lose just once, the cost to get your data back is going to be insane. Push it on the cloud and be done with it. <clears throat> We're going through a big change right now. Finance traditionally wouldn't have to think about, well, what is the impact of cybersecurity? It's nothing I have to plan for, I have a scenario for it, that's IT's job. But the role of finance has changed dramatically in the last few years. It's gone from reporting on numbers to actually driving strategy. I was reading an article in Forbes and they said, today's CFO needs to bridge the gap between strategy and finance whenever possible. They have to bring this unique perspective. Uh, they have to understand how will this cause a financial impact if we make this decision. We have to make sure that we're adding value on those big business ideas because we want to make sure that our, we understand the impact, whether costly or profitable to our company. The role of the CFO and the CFO's office has gone from being one of backward-looking governance and compliance to forward-looking strategy and planning. And this has been a difficult transition for a lot of organizations to make, especially companies that were in the, if it ain't broke, I'm not going to fix it model. Um, companies did a little better if they were in, just because it ain't broke doesn't mean I can't make it a little bit better. But the ones who said, hey, the way we close the books now, that's the same way, same way grandpappy did it back in the 50s. We're going to keep closing the books the same way. Those companies are not thriving. The ones that are thriving are where they're making that pivot to treating finance as a driver of strategy. Companies where finance uh, is an afterthought. Companies that treat finance like this useless overhead department designed to be minimized, those are the companies that are going to be irrelevant before this decade is over. Not only are they going to be bankrupt because the finance department was trying to tell them and nobody would listen, their people are going to flee for the exits in the finance department and beyond. We all want to be adding value because the war for talent is real. I just now appreciate it. I'm having lots of war and battle metaphors today. It's clear what's on my mind. My apologies. <clears throat> but this war, uh, this war for talent has really real financial implications. Uh, finding top talent, hiring that top talent, managing turnover, training our staff, managing our short-term leave, providing the resources that are required for people to work remotely. They not only have complexities, they have costs that we need to consider. And all this is compounded by the great resignation. Um, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, 47.4 million people in the United States voluntarily quit their jobs in 2021, close to 50 million in one year. That's uh, something like a fifth of the labor force. It's absolutely insane. <clears throat> Adding to our level of headaches, not to depress you all, uh, supply chain disruption has become a major issue, a major headache uh, for finance departments. There was a Deloitte study I was reading recently that said 44% of CFOs said that shortages or delays in getting the products they need have increased the average cost of those companies by more than 5%. Um, they've, they've said that that, along with cyber risk and operational slash geopolitical risk, are the big things impacting their supply chains. They also, in that survey, asked CFOs, how has your supply chain been changing? But also they asked them, how do you expect your supply chain to change? within the next three years. And the responses ranged from diversification of sourcing. There was this big narrowing down to a preferred vendor model. You know, put all of your eggs in one basket and then you have bigger power. They're actually the pendulum has gone the other way. 
uh, companies now are diversifying. So they're not just narrow sourcing when there is an availability of, and it's not just uh, products, it's services too. We don't want to put all of our eggs in one um, you know, basket of this company that's going to provide this product if they can't have the people to actually do it. So it's diversification of, of sources. It's a greater vertical integration where they're actually getting into their supply chain. It's uh, increasing sourcing from various regions, decreasing sourcing from other regions. It's, it's actually, there's even an interesting pendulum going to bringing development of products back to North America, uh, where it's been going out of for a while. But the biggest way finance has transformed in the last two years is actually just trying to get a handle on what's happening and what's going to happen. So a lot of you spent 2020 reacting. You got things done in the duct tape of modern business, Microsoft Excel, but then you spent 2021 implementing things. You implemented scenario planning because you were trying to help define the possible scenarios and how to deal with them if they occurred. Strategic modeling because you wanted to figure out what your constraints were. Profitability and cost management, because you were trying to figure out which customers or products or locations were making you money or which ones were costing you money. Data visualization, so that you could have real-time access to data. Make sure that you're absorbing that information as it comes in. And I've never seen a bigger push than the last two years for narrative reporting, because it's not just enough over the last two years to say we missed our budget or we beat it. We have to explain why. We have to open a dialogue, a back and forth communication around our numbers. And speaking of numbers, really rolling with the segues today, we're going to dive into those numbers around finance transformation. A lot of while all of you are here. So we're going to look at some of that data that we gathered in our survey. Um, first, we have to look at who responded. We had close to 500 total respondents this year. Now we've done a survey over the last five years, the state of business analytics. This year, we said, we're gonna go broader. We're gonna do finance transformation. And this is the most survey respondents we've ever had, um, including there are some for multiple companies. So it ended up being uh, called around 300 if you kind of remove the, the duplicate people from different companies. And this is kind of how they broke out. Over 90% of our respondents uh, fell within 17 different industries. Uh, to the point that we only had, I think, 9.5% as kind of an other sort of category. We had a lot of people from financial services respond this year, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, normally, it, uh, it's kind of more spread around, but uh, something is in the air uh, in the banking world. We also had a lot of high-tech, healthcare, consumer packaged goods, uh, industrial, uh, industrial manufacturing, Kind of rounding out the rest of the top five. We had a healthy representation across all sizes of business. So what you see here is that slightly over a quarter of our respondents represented companies in the 250 million to 1 billion range in annual revenue. We actually had really even distribution across all of the others. Uh, and we didn't bin this, they had, to, they had to pick a bin. Like we didn't create these to make it perfectly even across. We even had 10% of our respondents from companies over a billion USD in size. That's really, really big. Um, that's Edward's expert analysis of the day. So if you're thinking, is that, are these results relevant to me because I fall into this? Yes, uh, this is relevant for everyone. So I wanna say thank you to all of you out there who responded to the survey. Some of you have actually taken part every single year that we've done a survey like this. And it's really helped us see where things are trending. Uh, a bunch of you though were new this year. We couldn't do this without your participation. I appreciate you doing your part um, so that this service we perform can be a reality. Uh, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be anything to show if it wasn't all of you contributing this data. So let's begin by looking at what's been happening recently. How have we been affected? Well, when we were boiling down the data out of all these drivers that have impacted companies in the last two years, every one of them was selected as the most impactful by between slightly more than 10% and slightly less than 20% of our respondents. Um, 
of those though, it's no surprising that the number one was supply chain. Uh, we thought that the grounding of the, uh, the Ever Given and the Suez Canal was a big deal, uh, but then the world as they've been trying to emerge from lockdowns and pandemic slowdowns, we found out that was absolutely nothing compared to the backup at ports all around the globe. Uh, there are some ships waiting upwards of two months just for waiting, just for dock space to be able to come in and get everything off. Technology advancement is an ever important driver. It impacts all businesses. No big shock that's coming in in second place. Another impact made more prominent by the pandemic is a shift in work style. Uh, probably all of us in this call together today are tuning in from our homes. I would guess less than 20% of you are actually probably at a company. And that change has had tremendous impact in all of our industries. If I were around the clock two years and I said, how many of you finance and accounting departments are ready to go remote in two weeks? The answer would have been close to zero, if not somehow negative, because I would hear back, it is impossible to close the books remote. We need to be in rooms. We need to talk over cubicle walls. But we figured out a way to do it because we're all really resourceful. Uh, rounding out a slew of impacts that uh, arguably could be attributed to pandemic effects in one way or another, you see things like client engagement, labor shortage, change in consumer confidence, cash reserves um, playing a role these days. Uh, ask Putin how he feels about those cash reserves on his side. I find it really interesting, even though it's down at the bottom of the chart here, cash reserves was, were still selected as the most prominent impact at this moment. Like, keep in mind, we just did this survey by 10.2% of our respondents. It just goes to show you that companies are still having a hard time remaining afloat. That was not meant to be a pun. Um, it's really hard to be successful during these times. It makes me realize how important uh, enterprise warrants management, how important FP&A groups are to our continued business survival. So diving in specifically uh, to the pandemic related issues, we see staffing as one of the major areas that was exposed to companies as the pandemic wore on. Where, where's on? <laughs> I implied it was over. It's nowhere near from over. Expenses were frozen so that arguably a whole lot of needed improvements weren't funded um, and couldn't be made. People work from home that caused its challenges, trying to manage models of all the different possibilities of what might happen, all the different versions of those models. It posed a lot of challenges to a bunch of our clients. Uh, this was a focus point of the strategic assessments that I'm involved in over the last couple of years. Um, they've gotten really popular and they've actually stayed so after everyone got over the initial stop everything and figure out what's happening phase at the beginning of our possibility of our pandemic. So people are still doing that modeling many possibilities in case you think that was a one and done. It's not. Um, some of the reasons behind that modeling and other troubles were processes taking forever, process being too manual, uh, leading people not able to respond to the world as it was changing. Having the right tools was a problem. Uh, getting stuck in analysis, not being able to take action. Uh, interestingly, 11.5% of our respondents didn't run into any of these troubles. And three, they said, yeah, we were fine. We didn't expose any deficiencies. Either, either we already had them and we knew about them, or it turns out we were awesome. Um, and only 3.7% said, yeah, something else that we didn't actually know about, and we just discovered it. We asked a really simple binary question of whether FP&A departments in COVID times are serving a more strategic role in their companies, whether they are being brought into the room more when it's time to talk about strategy. The question was really simple. Has your FP&A department served in a more strategic role since the start of the pandemic? I wanna take a moment here and invite you to imagine for a moment what the chart I'm about to show you looks like. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you a hint. It's a pie chart and it has two slices. Your job, guess the size of the slices. How, what percentage said fp has served in a more strategic role? What percentage has said, no, we are not more strategic now than we used to be. Ready? One, two, three. Congratulations. This should make all the fp audience members feel a whole lot more appreciated. <clears throat> so as you see over the last two years, 
FP&A departments are contributing a whole lot more to the strategy of companies. They're generating these multiple future scenarios. They're doing the analysis on what's going on behind the numbers. Companies have clearly realized the value of having their financial analysts around. They can help figure out strategies. Uh, by the way, I didn't really talk about the visualizations. Um, just on a, some people always ask me this technically. We, uh, some, some of these actually <clears throat> came right out of SurveyMonkey, um, but a whole lot of them, we wanted to improve the look and feel. So we pulled them into uh, Oracle Analytics Cloud. And we were playing around with best ways to visualize this one. And uh, we came up with something that is really helpful. Like what better way is there to represent a binary question than through a pie chart? And the answer is obvious. It's a word cloud. Um, and you can see how much bigger the word yes is than the word no in terms of this. Yeah, it, just because you can do a visualization doesn't mean you should. Uh, but congratulations to our FPNA friends on the, the big yes there. Uh, you, you got yes uh, to the question of your importance to your company's strategies. So what are people using? Uh, this one is fascinating because I don't see anyone else doing market share calculations, at least uh, nothing that I kind of trust with large volumes of data. Sometimes it's gut feel or they ask like 25 people. So this is the best I've been able to, uh, to come up with in terms of market share calculations on ERP and other products. Lots of companies have made the switch to Oracle Cloud ERP. So the question is, which ERP software does your company use? This is actually the first year uh, in our six years of surveying it, Oracle Cloud ERP has come in first place. Um, it is a bit of a surprise. Um, one of the, I, I say it's a surprise. Uh, one of the companies that joined us is a company called CSS, Argonos CSS. And I just look at, and they implement Oracle ERP Cloud. Uh, they used to implement JD Edwards and EBS, but they're making the move towards Oracle Cloud ERP. Looking at the growth in their revenue, I kind of had a hunch um, as to how big Oracle Cloud ERP had gotten, but that was the first time I've seen it on a chart. And uh, as always, Oracle as a vendor uh, dominates here, because in addition to Cloud ERP, you've got JD Edwards, EBS, PeopleSoft, NetSuite, all taking prominent places in the chart. Uh, if you total all those up, uh, they equal 118.6%. Uh, no one chat me on that. It's actually because most companies have more than one ERP, and we let them do a multi-select. <clears throat> because, think about it. Since so many of those respondents were like a billion and up, a lot of those companies have multiple ERPs. It's the nature of their business. It just turns out that a lot of those companies have multiple ERPs. The predominant ones that kept showing up more and more often were Oracle. Uh, let's talk about some changes. Uh, let's check out Microsoft Dynamics. It has made its way steadily up the charts over the last few years. Uh, again, not a ma massive surprise. One of the uh, companies in, that joined Argono is Arbella, and they do nothing but Microsoft Dynamics, and they've seen this similar massive increase. <clears throat> NetSuite's market share, uh, while still a bit low, it continues to grow over the last few years. Uh, Lawson's not a new player in the market. It is making an impressive comeback um, after being way down on this chart a few years ago. Uh, SAP and PeopleSoft have been in decline recently, and those trends continue. The one that's really interesting of all those, if I may riff for a bit, is Workday. They were like number one with a bullet like four or five years ago, and they did this exponential growth to about 10% market share, and it's just kind of capped. And I, and I will be the first to admit when I have no clue as to why. I have no clue as to why. Uh, why Workday has plateaued. Um, I've dug into it and I, I'm not aware at, at this point of any reason for it. Um, it's, it, by the way, we have such large volumes of data. This is central limit theorem. This is a reliable number um, that it went up and then it kind of plateaued at that. So in all, in order for those companies to pull all that data together, uh, they need a consolidation product. Um, in general, sometimes they try and do it within their general ledger, but because, as I just said, some of those companies have multiple GL products, they're trying to figure out what can we do to add them up, no matter what source they're coming from. So the question is, what product, what is the number one most predominant product you're using kind of in the closing consolidation space? Oracle EPM, uh, to be clear, uh, we just 
we're curious about EPM in general. So that's HFM plus Oracle's EPM FCC product. Uh, together, they enjoy a rather healthy market share. Um, but in case you think that we're only getting Oracle EPM respondents, uh, no, uh, we have across the board 70% um, everywhere else. Sometimes people don't do it as a product. Uh, sometimes people do it through the back end. That's a horrible choice of words. So just as we're we're doing our debits and credits in our general ledger, some people are actually closing in the general ledger. This is still quite popular. Uh, it was really recommended till about 2007. I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend you don't do this. Render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Do in your ERP the, the transactional level data, pull the aggregated stuff to combine that data, bring it together, do the eliminations, um, do it up there at the consolidation level, um, and don't try and mix the two. Um, if you're interested, uh, contact me, uh, eroski at interrel.com. I could use the referral bonus. Now, in all seriousness, it's a lot easier to do it in a consolidation system to do it everywhere else. Uh, Maybe surprising, maybe not to all of you, Excel is the ever popular, ever versatile tool uh, that no finance person can live without. It's probably open if I alt tab to it on my own screen right now. Uh, this has what I consider a concerningly high market share amongst our closed consolidation products. <sighs> Seriously, people, there's a whole lot of risk on relying on ever bigger, ever growing, ever formula intensive, extensive Excel models for an important work. Uh, business process. Just try not to do it there. Uh, Workday, formerly uh, Adaptive Insights, they make this impressive showing at 10.4%, uh, actually higher than the ERP, uh, which is interesting in case you think people are only putting uh, Adaptive on top of ERP. They're not. It was a separate company. Uh, SAP Planful, which is uh, formerly Host Analytics, and Anaplan, um, all upwards of 7.5%. Uh, Espace hanging in there, but uh, going way down. Um, as is uh, as one stream, not one stream's not going way down. It's just Espace is going down. They're about the level of one stream um, at this point. We thought it'd be interesting to correlate the question. I, I need to let you absorb this for a second. Correlate the question about what product companies were using with the question about whether the respondent would recommend it. Um, so. How likely are you to recommend what you're currently using for consolidation to other people? Think of it like a net promoter score uh, for the software that the respondent uses at their company. I am going to let you absorb it um, for a bit. Uh, what I would recommend is if you're gonna read anything into this, total the very likely with the likely, because that's kind of a subjective thing and say, cool, um, you know, S-Base, even though it's down to 4, uh, you know, uh, 4% or something, um, you know, 50% of people are still likely or very likely to recommend it, which is not a whole lot of people. Uh, and a plan, only 21% are likely or very likely to recommend it. Uh, you, uh, Oracle EPM, I don't know what that totals to, 63% are likely or very likely. You also could flip it around and total up the unlikely and the very unlikelies um, and, or, help total them all. You could do one bucket for very likely, likely and somewhat, another bucket for somewhat unlikely, unlikely and very unlikely, and then a bucket down the middle. I was appreciative, even of the ones where we had a ton of data, hardly anybody went down the middle. <laughs> we, have, we have strongly opinionated fp &A, uh, people out there. Here's a look at what people use for forecasting systems. Uh, this, that, that's the software we're using for planning, budgeting, forecasting, anything creating forward looking data. Oracle EPM, that includes on-prem period planning as well as uh, EPM cloud planning. Uh, together, those dominate the chart. Uh, a lot of companies still using S-Base on this one. Uh, so it actually comes in at number two, higher than Excel. Now, to be clear, we let them choose one thing on this. We said, what is the predominant tool, the number one thing you consider to be your forecasting system? Not like the ERP one where we let people choose them all over the place. We said, just pick one. Um, I think if we had said, pick anything you're using, Excel would have been near 100%. But in terms of predominant, EPM, fall by S-Base, fall by Excel, plan for Anna plan, and Cognos. Uh, we do see some... Cloud first options on here, which is nice. Uh, planful, Anaplan, Workday. And some people just hold on to old stuff. Uh, Cognos, um, SAP, they've had kind of a resurgence lately uh, with, uh, what is it, SAP Analytics Cloud, which does some planning capabilities. Uh, but still, they're down there at you know almost rounding error percent at 5%. 
This is the same likelihood to recommend breakdown. Uh, this time it's by a planning product. Um, again, sort of just mentally kind of combine very likely and likely and sort of flip that over with like unlikely and very unlikely. Um, so the number one in terms of very likely Oracle EPM, number one in terms of likely would be F space, closely followed by Excel. I don't know what world I'm living in, uh, and Tagitech. And I think if you total them all up, uh, like Oracle EPM is number one, um, followed by uh, S-Base, um, followed by, I think, Excel or Tagitech. We also looked at account reconciliation tools. So what is the account recs you're using? Uh, number one, a big shock, uh, Oracle account recs, uh, on-prem and cloud-based. I say no big shock, it's only 28%. It's just because of how high the people were on the Oracle EPM side, it makes sense, it's about 28%. Uh, their biggest competitor, Blackline, makes a pretty good showing at around 10% of the account rec market. Workiva and Workday, also quite prominent on here. And there are a lot of options not listed here. I intentionally did not allow for a choice, human power or Excel. So everybody just tossed it into other. So I think that's where 7.7% .7 comes from is they're getting it done through blood, sweat, toil, and tears. <clears throat> we asked how, what system does your company use for report generation? Report generation is a busy, busy field. Uh, we actually had to limit this list uh, to those that I think were in the top 10 or so. I'll show you the full list in a second, but uh, you'll, you'll see it. It gets not an eye chart, just a bunch of tiny little columns in a second. So in terms of what system companies use using for report generation, Oracle, in the Oracle EPM, Excel, narrative reporting, top three, uh, Power BI continues a really strong showing that we've seen over the, the years. You see a lot of longtime major players uh, reigning on the map. Uh, business objects and Cognos. Uh, some less desirable options are still in serious play here. So direct from the data source, eh, uh, using ERP tools um, instead of dedicated reporting tools. I just feel it gets people too much into having to understand the underlying data and not make sense out of it. Uh, S-Base is 17.3%, which is holding stronger than I might have expected. Here's the larger picture just for completeness' sake, because I know some of you are screenshotting. <clears throat> Um, so this is everything. What, what systems does your company use for report generation? And we came up with just about everything we could, which is why other came in at 2.2%. Fascinatingly, 1.1% uh, said we have no clue um, how we're actually doing. So you'll also see some um, players kind of filling, like what happened to MicroStrategy? What happened to Tableau? They're on there. You know, they've been around for a while. They're just down there into the less than 10%. Uh, we also see some things that are Again, a little bit concerning, handwriting SQL queries, using old outdated systems, which you've lumped under legacy. Um, and these include products that aren't supported anymore. Uh, web analysis, uh, SQR, interactive reporting, the Excel spreadsheet add-in, things like that, that have been retired for a lot of years, we tossed under legacy. We also see some tools that are specialized in being really good at talking to SBAs. So like our pals over at Applied OLAP, um, I think a couple of them are on today's webinar. Um, you see Dodeca out there at 4.4%, uh, um, uh, Arc Plan at 7.6%. Um, some of the smaller dashboarding tools like ClickView, Tibco, Spotfire, we, we see them out there getting layered in alongside a lot of other options, but they take their place in the mix. So we said, what systems do you use for data integration, mapping, and transformation? And this one's really interesting. Because in terms of data integration tools, what you've got at the top of the list is a non-strategic product. Um, you've got uh, Oracle FDM and FDMEE, uh, which are on-prem Oracle data integration solutions. These are supposed to be being phased out in favor of, well, like the next one down, data management, which is basically FDMEE for Oracle EPM, um, which, is a, which is version migrated and integrated. It's kind of part of the overall cloud solutions. But you're still seeing actually the original on-prem product at the top of the chart. Um, its replacement, however, has gone up. Um, it's solidly in second place. I just think a lot of people haven't turned off uh, the FDME side. Informatica has always been and probably will be for some time entrenched in that top three. It's really popular with IT groups. Uh, business people uh, tend not to be as big of a fan, but it's been out there for a while. It has connectors to everything under God's creation. Uh, Oracle's 
other really prominent data integration tool and uh, another highly technical one um, is uh, ODI. And then of course, there are the cloud-based replacements for them. Uh, relative newcomer, OneCloud, um, we had to combine it with the Workiva W data because it's essentially the same product. Workiva, maybe it doesn't know, bought OneCloud uh, in uh, late summer, early fall last year. 18.4% of you are using uh, Workiva's W data or the OneCloud product. Um, SSIS over on the Microsoft remains prominent, just not dominant. Sui so said, what systems do you use for metadata and master data management? This is my, my final kind of market share type one. Uh, DRM is the older on-prem solution from Oracle. It's a data relationship management. It's been around for a long time, still at the top. Uh, number two for kind of hierarchies, metadata, master data is uh, enterprise data management, which is sort of the cloud-based uh, hierarchy tool uh, from Oracle. You see Dell Boomi, uh, really strong up there at 27.6, uh, Calibra at 17.8. Sometimes people kind of confuse an ETL tool with a metadata tool. So we had a lot of people throwing random things um, in there. So we kind of just lumped them under other, or I have no idea because it's outside of my area. So let's let's take it back up a notch for a second. We're gonna we're gonna rise back up out of the data to talk about the digital renaissance, um, or as some people are calling it, the fourth generation of the industrial revolution. I believe it is an exercise for the user to go figure out what generations two and three are. I think generation one started with like the cotton gin or something. We've been inventing things for, well, throughout all of time. The industrial revolution started somewhere between 122 and 170 years ago. Necessity is the mother of invention. And in this time of economic uncertainty, companies are driving transformation through innovative technologies. The fourth industrial revolution, industry 4.0, it's a way to overcome disruption. It's a way to take advantage of emerging opportunities. Industry 4.0 was made possible by this increasingly global network of interconnected objects that can collect and exchange data. Science Direct Magazine defined industry 4.0 as the transition from a time, I love this, the transition from a time when people worked with computers to a time when computers worked without humans. That's either awesome or it's terrifying, uh, but it's coming and it's bringing rapid change to technologies and industries and societal patterns and processes. And it's best viewed through four different facets. Number one is interconnection. How can we make sure the machines, the devices, the sensors, the people are all connecting and communicating? Number two, information transparency. Can we go see all the comprehensive information we need to go make our decisions? Number three, it's technol technical assistance, which is the technological facility of our systems to make sure they're assisting the humans in decision-making problem solving they wanna do. Also the ability to help humans with things that are difficult or unsafe. And the fourth facet, decentralized decisions, which is the ability of actual cyber systems to make physical decisions on their own and then perform that task as autonomously as possible. And together, these facets provide this new level of depth and breadth um, to the entire value chain across the enterprise. Because vertically, it lets us share data, lets us integrate processes, lets us integrate vertically across the entire organization. And then horizontally, it includes all of our internal operations, everything from our suppliers to our customers to our key value chain pro providers and partners outside the organization. We are already impacting the finance operating model and industry 4.0 is only gonna accelerate that. It's opening doors for FP&A. Uh, industry 4.0 is giving this amazing tools, this amazing technology to really expand the value that we can provide for our people and our customers. CFOs are now able to take the lead on strategy. They can take the lead using tools like uh, RPA, robotic process automation, data analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, and a whole lot more to keep the companies more efficient and make sure that we're delivering the right information to the right people at the right time to help them make better business decisions faster. So what are the ways fp &A has been transforming over the last couple of years? And back to the data. Let's dive into some processes for a second. One of the first things we checked in with our respondents is what EPM system they were using at their companies. What, were, what processes were they doing? And uh, 
what we saw is pretty much everything is above 40%. But people also reported strongly that they're using cloud-based systems. This is a lot more than it was a few years ago. It displays this current trend um, that's only going to increase. The more established EPM systems in the cloud are all related to planning. We also see uh, cloud-based analysis and dashboarding offered by a lot of providers. So no big shock that that's in place at over 50% of the customers. Uh, the one furthest behind is allocations and costing. The cloud-based products, it's, it's less that they've yet to really take off and more than just a whole lot of people either aren't doing it or they're doing it in Excel. Uh, we are seeing a, an uptick. Um, Oracle did a change a few years ago. They started bundling uh, profitability and cost management in with the rest of Oracle EPM Cloud. And people are like, well, I own the whole toolbox. Why don't I go see what that tool does? So it's really gone up. Um, so I think now that they're kind of giving it away with everything else, I think that's going to increase. Now, we then analyzed whether solutions are actually doing what people needed them to do. And if you notice, most systems are hovering around 25% positive responses. This is what we call in the industry not good. Um, companies have got to improve. They've got to change their processes. It's not enough to throw technology at it. We have to up our game. We need to go out there and meet more of our business requirements. Whatever the system isn't doing, it needs to be increased. Uh, good news for those of you doing reports. Uh, you're coming in first place. Nice job for the standardized reportings amongst you. Um, account rec people, maybe you're in the awesome 17%, but it looks like they need uh, most of the work. One of the most important metrics that we've always taken a look at, we get asked about this one more than anything else, um, how long companies are taking to close their books. So right now we're looking at close length at the monthly level. Notice right away, a lot of people are closing their books in zero days. Uh, this is sometimes called continuous close, sometimes called virtual close. We have seen that turn out to realistically be two or three days after they add comments and publish it out, but I wasn't going to go change the numbers. So there you go, 18.4%. I, I trust you with your data. Uh, years ago, we saw these prominent spikes at 5, 10, 15 days to close. That's actually no longer as much of the case. Um, People, it used to go to five, 10 or 15 days because that was one business week, two business week, three business weeks. And somebody finally said, wait, why are we expanding to fill the time allotted? So what we've noticed is a trend. What was five has become three. What was longer than five has gone down to five. What was 10 has now gone to less than 10. And we used to have this really long tail of companies. Go back and look at my survey from six years ago. Like, I think it went up to 44 days or something out there past 10. Um, they've largely grouped now at about 10 or even fewer days. Quarter close still takes significantly longer, um, and for good reason, of course. Those spikes that we referred to that we used to see at the month level, still here um, at the quarter level. So you see five days, 10 days, 15 days. These are uh, major way stations for companies on their journey to faster close cycles. Uh, note that six through nine is collectively the biggest one here. But if you actually dove into it, each individual length from six to nine is less than five or 10. I just want to carry the same banding across from the other one. We've just seen a massive uptick. Like there was kind of nothing happening in that six to nine day space a few years ago, but people are, are getting faster. Quarter close still takes significantly longer and for good reason, of course. Uh, those spikes we referred to that we used to see at the month level, still here at the quarter level, um, five, 10, 15 days, yeah. Um, Basically, if you're still taking longer than two weeks, get it down to two weeks. If you're still taking one to two weeks, get it down to under a week. Another key statistic we gather is time to produce an annual budget. Uh, we used to see a lot of companies saying six months or more. These days, it's one to four months for 60% of companies. More and more have been speeding up the process. Uh, we see less than one month now at 12% of companies. Um, don't, if you're at the 6%, don't you kind of wish you worked for a company or did a process that was over in like the, the zero to one? I left the NA one on here. Um, I usually take it out uh, because in this case, it actually has a special meaning. NA normally means we don't do that thing or don't understand it or whatever. But this 7.2% is actually the people out there doing beyond budgeting. They're not just doing a budget. They're not doing a budget process. Either doing a forecast and calling it a budget, or they're not doing it at all. Congratulations to the ones who said, well, we got out of it. We just don't have to do it. When it comes to producing a forecast, um, 
you see these lengths much shorter than the budget cycles. And that's fortunately what we have here. 50% of companies forecasting in two weeks or less. That is a great milestone. It used to be companies were essentially always forecasting. Companies that were able to do that in a few days did, a, did really well during COVID uh, because they kept having to make multiple passes and multiple versions of their forecast. It's really hard if it takes like three weeks to a month to be spitting these things out every couple of days. We asked how long it's been since so your financial close software was uh, implemented, redesigned, or upgraded. This is really fascinating because uh, most of our clients haven't done that recently. But what we found out was companies have been really busy in the last couple of years making changes to how their closing consolidation systems work. They, they basically were learning um, as they went through pandemic and said, uh, we've got to, to push through and solve this. Uh, we also cross-reference uh, by how long companies report versus the last time um, they essentially updated their systems. And what you find, if I could summarize that for you, the more recently you update your closed system, the faster your closed cycle is. So as you can see it, the people that, have, that are able to close in under a week, those are the ones who have redone their system in the last one to two years or less than a year. In terms of forecasting and budgeting, seeing the same effect out there. People are redoing, uh, re-implementing or upgrading or redesigning their planning systems like it's gone out of style for the last year or two. It's, it's a significant wave. Um, same trend here. If, uh, if you redid your budget system, you have a really fast budget process. Uh, if you're still back in the old way, it just takes forever. I'll, I'll stick this Hyperion one in just for a second. One thing that a lot of respondents indicated they haven't done is actually upgraded from unsupported versions of Hyperion products. Uh, we're seeing most of them, about half with a plan to do a cloud migration, but a third are planning to upgrade to 11.2, uh, which is going to be supported at least for the rest of this decade. Uh, a quarter of our respondents were on unsupported versions and tend to stay there until it breaks. Um, if I could offer some free consulting here, don't do that. Um, upgrade before it breaks. Does your current financial talent possess the skills and competencies to interpret and manipulate data to drive informed decisions? 76% of respondents say they do, which is awesome. 11.9% say, say they have some room to grow. And 11.6% say, we actually have no idea. Does your company plan to invest in upskilling your team? Thank you, thank you, thank you for investing in training. 75.8% of you said they do. 14.5% of you say we have no idea at all. And I made this slide just for you people in industry out there. This required a great deal of manual work to put this together, but I get asked the question all the time. I don't want the broad data. I want my industry specific data. So if you're going to screenshot one thing, screenshot this one. I'm cool if you tweet it to your heart's content, tag me, I'll retweet it. Um, this really gives you a comparison across, like who takes the longest to close? Government education, fall by oil and gas on a monthly basis. Who takes the longest on a quarterly basis? Construction, engineering, media and entertainment, and oil and gas. Who takes the longest to, uh, to forecast? Professional services. Who takes the longest to budget? Retail and healthcare. But fascinatingly, retail takes the fastest to reforecast. They just don't care about that annual budget. Don't worry, we're coming in. We're going to stick the landing just a couple minutes late. Uh, this is a question we have asked before a few times. Uh, well, actually, every time the most popular answer has been within two years. We've been asking it for six years. Don't let that fool you. You might end up waiting for it and waiting for it and waiting for it, and then suddenly finding out all your competitors are using it before you get around to it, uh, which actually brings to mind one of my favorite Bill Gates quotes. We always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. And he actually, people tend to stop the quote there. He actually said after it, don't let yourself be lulled into inaction. So let's talk about that. What we're gonna do, got five slides left. Let's talk about where we're gonna go from here. And I'm gonna give you away a case go pass, which I will do in about 90 seconds. Uh, first of all, my advice, make sure you personally are changing faster than your company. And then if you have any influence on it, make sure your company is changing faster than the industry that you are in. <clears throat> Some of you know this, in, in addition to my role as Argonne Mineral CEO, I also help strategize with our customers on where they wanna be in the next one to three years with planning and consolidation analytics. If all this has inspired you and you want to improve and change and transform, my group is a great way to help you find that destination. Uh, we come in, in in a very short amount of time, we help create that roadmap for change. Uh, if you're interested, 
There's Danielle White's email at the bottom. She's the head of our vision team. So email Danielle White. She'll talk you through how we can help you plot that strategic direction. That was my only sales pitch. Um, I will give you an education mention though. Um, Danielle's team also has an extensive training group. They do public and private training. If you want to learn more about Hyperion or SBase or other parts of Oracle EPM Cloud, go to epm.bi slash classroom training. Now, the part you've been waiting for, not only am I about to stop talking, which is going to thrill a lot of you, I'm going to give away a KSCO pass. Uh, I mentioned this as people were joining. If you don't know what KSCO is, by far the best EPM and analytics conference out there. If you go register, put in code Argano NRL, it takes $100 off, share it freely, widely, have a ball, tweet it, LinkedIn it, Insta it, whatever you want to do. Okay. Um, one of you, though, doesn't just save 100 One of you pays absolutely nothing for your KSCO 22 pass. And the winner is... Hold on, let me randomize. Uh, Jeff Inman, Einman, I-N-E-M-A-N. Um, if that was you, congratulations, you're a lucky winner. Uh, if that's not you, please save $100. Um, and everybody, I want to see all of you in Texas at the end of June. This entire effort wouldn't be possible without the great analytic capabilities and efforts of Joe Altman, Noah Stetler, Wayne Van Sluis, uh, Joe Rebecca and Robin all did an awesome job of helping put this presentation together. And as I said before, you have my thanks. There'd be no data to analyze. There'd be no community if it wasn't for all of you. So thank you. Sincerely, sincerely, sincerely thank you, each and every one of you. Now, let's go out and fulfill the promise of the digital renaissance for all. And uh, let's close with a video on how we're all going to do that together. The digital renaissance unleashes the power of human potential by elevating our possibilities beyond the bounds of traditional thought. How we communicate with each other, how we overcome disability and disease, how we conduct commerce, how we feed ourselves, where we live, how we work and play, how we travel, and how we learn about each other and the world we share is all changing, expanding, improving, transforming and each increment of our cultural and technological evolution gains us both the satisfaction of attainment as well as a new set of expectations for the future what's next what's possible what's better most importantly the potential for these wondrous achievements to be shared with all humankind in a more equal way is higher than ever before. Radical reductions in poverty, hunger, sickness, oppression can be matched with unparalleled increases in literacy, information, opportunity, and freedom. The promise of the digital renaissance knows no bounds. Those who understand this and have the knowledge and the skills and the insatiable ambition to create in this new world for all of this new world will put a mark on human history and improve the lives of generations yet to come. And in this time of fundamental transformation comes Argano, a revolutionary and purpose-built firm, a new model a new way, a collection of like-minded travellers bound by a common culture with a simple mission, fulfilling the promise of the digital renaissance for all. Thank you, everyone. Uh, in the words of Bill and Ted, be excellent to each other. <laughs>